another one of my entrances. This video is all about traveling back in time. Um, I have been selling a lot of bows this past winter on eBay, and if you've noticed, I've kind of cooled my heels on bows for a bit because I've discovered something that really speaks to me. Um, uh, javelins, um, darts, um, simply taking something and throwing it more than the, the technical nature of the bow. It just seems more elemental. Well, this is my fire circle, and there's north and uh, east and south and west, and I've had some elders from the local tribe um, stop in and do talks, and it's great to get a lot out of it. And it's not just Native um, American philosophy and view of life. What all this stuff does is really connect us, and hopefully by the, the end of this, we'll have even more of a connection. But I am going to treat this like, instead of the north, as I'm going around the circle, being um, the beginning, I'm going to think about it a little backwards. I'm going to start at the north and go around. And north, in this case, um, the wheel of weapons, is going to represent now. Now, people using um, nice uh, deer rifles and scopes and compound bows and compound crossbows. But if you march back, and even though bows may have been around for 10, 15,000 years, that's just a drop in the bucket as far as the history of humans. And so if I was to march around here, go back 10,000 years, 15, uh, the exact time, or even if I'm off 5,000 years, whatever, because I'm going to be discussing 400,000 years, so I can, there's a little bit of slap factor here. You travel back in time, you get to the bow. This is just a variation of a, a long bow. It looks like an English long bow in many ways. It kind of resembles a basa bow um, from Africa. Um, simple D bow, but it works for the sake of this argument. We didn't have to go that far back. Now, predating this bow, even though they still use um, this device in Mexico for fishing, spear fishing, and the Aboriginal people of Australia still use it, you can guess what I'm talking about. I'm going to walk back further than the bow. Not hundreds of thousands of years, uh, but you know, this is the Atlatl, even though they were found in all five. There's seven continents except Antarctica, and each region had its own name. This is actually an atlatl. This is an Aztec design of this um, dart thrower. A lot of people are using basket maker, woomeris, but you start getting into a way of propelling this dart with more force, greater distance, by increasing the length of your arm, and also the power stroke, because this has a very long power stroke, you just achieved a, a huge coup, stone points. Now I'm going to jump a little bit. I read, uh, or actually saw a YouTube video, and this person was discrediting evolution and all this stuff, and describing the, the pre-modern humans as dumb apes. Well, Neanderthals were able to make nice hand axes um, flaking, and so they had the ability to to use stones to make tools. And their brains were about the same size as ours. They were not stupid people. In fact, they're still around. Um, with some exceptions, we have Neanderthal DNA. So they weren't hunted by, over hunted by pro magnons. They were bred. There was weddings. Um, little pro magnon Neanderthal babies. And, you know, I went all winter wearing shorts, ironically. I got frostbite on a 50 degree day, even though I survived 10 below my, minus um, with shorts. Frostbite, carrying around a weed torch in the propane tank froze up and I didn't even feel it. I have no cold and hot nerves in my leg. Oh, forget that. Now, folks, as we travel back in time, I'm going to go around the circle and I'm going to go a long way. I'm going to go 400,000 years. I'm going to go beyond um, Homo sapiens sapiens, and I'm going to get into um, Homo heidelbergensis. Now, that YouTube video I saw on 
the Shonigan Spears, which I'm going to be discussing, discredited in a several different ways. They said that uh, Homo heidelbergensis were just apes. Well, they not. They were intelligent. They had brains about the size of ours. And if you actually ever lived in the wild, you know, and, and used tools and, and didn't just, like, eat rat and dead stuff you found, it takes intelligence to, like, live in the land, live off the land. These people, these proto-people were not stupid. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, now, as I go back 400,000 years, I'm kind of verging on um, matters of religion um, because of the whole evolution creation thing. Now, I'm going to preface this, first of all, by, by talking about a professor I had at Michigan State University, Michigan, Geology of Michigan, and it talked about the processes that formed Michigan over time. And just in the middle of the lecture, he stopped and he said, you know what? I'm... I... I read the Bible, I'm a good Christian, and I've thought about this for many, many years, and what I've come up with is that, who's the greatest scientist in the world? You know, he said, God is the greatest scientist, and I'm not proposing um, a philosophy towards that in either way, I'm just kind of um, <laughs> trying to sneak my way out of potential arguments here. Um, the Bible is a certain thing um, that has a specific purpose in, in your lives. Um, and when you go way, 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 way back, and they start talking about the days, on the first day, the second day, well, the purpose of that book, in my estimation, was not in practical geology or, or astrophysics. I mean, that wasn't the purpose. So one day could have meant um, a great span of time, and instead of explaining the processes to people um, for 2,000 years ago, and getting into mineralogy and organic chemistry and stratigraphy and astrophysics and stuff like that, which would have made that um, particular book that's so special in many people's minds, um, the size of the Smithsonian Institute, it was then just the first day, the second day, the third day, and all that other stuff was put in there. I'd also like to say that if you are um, a deeply religious person, um, we look back and we think about Galileo. Now, he was um, saying that the sun didn't go around the earth, um, that he was um, convicted of heresy, and it took 300 years for him to like, get out of trouble. That's neither here nor there. No judgments. I'm just um, trying to put the idea out there that maybe our brains and our thoughts and our imagination were there to fill in the blanks. You know, you Here's people, we can come up with um, ways to explain things on our own. Just like having kids, you don't just like baby them and fight their battles for them. Your, your ideal parenting situation is kick their butt a little bit along the way and then turn out independent thinking adults that can think for themselves. They don't stop loving us as parents when they're independent and thinking for themselves. Um, but anyway. Let's go back in time. I'm going to walk past the ball. I'm walking past the ant ladle. And my favorite um, projectile is thrown at the baton to come on to my fire. Maybe it wasn't for a weapon system, but there were certainly cord assisted um, javelins up there. We have to walk. Oh. 400,000 years, and we've already passed modern humans. And then we're in the, um, the area of the Homo heidelbergensis. I'm not going to be all like a monkey or anything. You know, they were just tough, tough, robust people with big brains so they could come up with stuff. Now the, the Shonigan Spears, if you read about the Shonigan Spears, it was a group of um, spears that could have been ceremoniously placed in an area that allowed them to be preserved and become the oldest complete hunting systems out there. Um, javelins, if you look at their construction, double taper starting from the center of gravity, taper towards the butt end, taper towards the tip end, not stone pointed, and this is important. They through like javelins, and people have recreated this and with good javelin ears, have been able to throw them 70 yards, which is pretty amazing. They're ballistic. These uh, Heidelbergensi were able to create 
a modern javelin. Now, when you read the literature, it says Homo heidelbergensis um, was able to design and manufacture a sophisticated hunting weapon. Well, I don't want to like insult heidelbergensis. Tough, tough people. Intelligent survivors. They weren't just scavenging, cracking bones, and eating tomorrow. Um, which scavenging is good. Some big old um, carnivore knocks down something, an old horse, and you come by the carcass, and all the meat's gone. But if you crack the bones, you have supercharged protein and fat in the bones. Um, so anyway, here it is. This is a javelin. Uh, my recreation of a 400,000-year-old weapon. The precursor, the great, 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 all the way back, Grand Pepe, of all ballistic weapons. The dart, and the atlatl, the bow and arrow. This is it. To me, touching this sign that could have been made 400,000 years ago is a very spiritual experience because I'm touching the past. I'm touching something that was created by somebody that came before us. And then everything else came from it. I'm just going to say that boldly. The bow and the arrow, the atlatl and dart, um, the modern javelin in the Olympics. Now, picture this. Now, I doubt that Heidelbergensis were sitting in their, their laboratories over um, coffee and looking at the board and working out equations for center of gravity and balance and density and stuff like this. Well. It was during an interglacial period, so there was a lot of um, conifers. So, spruce. Now, they were hunting horses. There were a lot of horse skeletons along with other large game. Now, I'm thinking that sometimes an invention that has greatness came about somewhat by serendipity. Now, you've got a horse. You have wood with no stone points. You're going to have to have a deep piercing point. And so, just by necessity, you're going to have to have this taper that probably goes deep enough to puncture both lungs of a horse. And so, you're going to naturally have this taper coming from about the center of gravity from uh, in an 8 foot, or I'm sorry, a 7 foot, 6 to 7 foot um, projectile. Now, in order to like throw this effectively, you have to have a certain um, mass, a certain weight. There are different things, but I'm going to use them interchangeably. But if you lighten it a little bit, you're going to wind up having a projectile that you can throw a little further. And so, taper the back end, which doesn't need to be super sturdy. This is the working end. This is the trailing end. And so you can taper this. You can thin it, thin it, thin it, make it as thin as possible. Probably put another point here because what happens if this breaks, you can flip it over and you've got a second point, secondary point. And so just the nature of creating a projectile that can pierce a thick animal like a horse and then is lightened with a second point without even thinking of how do I create a a javelin um, that's going to throw right, maybe it just happened. Maybe this just happened from creating a long piercing point and lightening it on the back end so you can throw it. Now from there, they discovered probably, I'm putting myself in the mind of a Heidelbergensis, I've been called a cave before. <laughs> they didn't look the case. Um, but when you notice that this throws so much better than just the short, stiff spear that isn't tapered. It's like, huh, there's something about the shape of this thing that works. They're problem solvers. All humans and proto-humans are problem solvers. And so maybe they then started fiddling around with lightening this more and um, discovered that, whoa, when you get the center of gravity at the third, and they probably had a different name for that, um, that these things would basically always land point down. Now, it doesn't have to be one-third. No, 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 no. There's varying. If you have one-third, you're going to have greater, um, let's say, accuracy 
and the point's going to land um, down a little farther. If you bump it back further, you're going to get more loft. It's going to stay in the air longer because it's not going to nosedive as much, so they'll actually start flying a little bit. In the Olympic, uh, or the modern javelins, they've adjust at the center of gravity so they land point down. If they just go skidding on the grass, flying because the center of gravity is back a little further, it doesn't count. So they move the center of gravity forward a little bit so it's a more consistent point down. Um, that is basically my take on everything. And I appreciate you sticking through it. <clears throat> and I also, I know bows are great. I love bows. I've made my living here and there with making bows and stuff. But start thinking about the weapons before and then just the raw physicality of, of throwing these things. I'm not going to throw it because I would embarrass myself because I'm not um, a strong, stout Heidel Braganzas. But that was it, and that's my take on it. Thank you very much.